from the humble beginnings in Focke-Wulf to becoming one of the most renowned aviation designers in the world, Kurt Tank is certainly one of the more interesting aircraft designers, especially for his work in India on the HF-24. To first find out why this aircraft became one of the more famous Kurt Tank jets, we need to go back in time to find the motivations of the Indian government. India was born out of a struggle for independence and a bloody partition that had immediately created one hostile neighbor. With the first prime minister wanting to make his country a vibrant democracy, he along with other Indian leaders emphasized the importance of technology and science in reaching India's full potential. The prime minister gave a speech in 1958 saying, Science has developed at an ever-increasing pace since the beginning of the century, so that gap between the advanced and backward countries has widened more and more. It is only by adopting the most vigorous of measures and by putting forward our utmost effort into the development of science that we can bridge this gap. The Prime Minister and his colleague, the Defense Minister, had been convinced that India needed to be self-reliant in weapons research and production. The ideas were confirmed when a British physicist in 1955 told the Prime Minister they should develop their own aviation into the Indians, Yugoslavs, Egyptians, and Indonesians forming the non-aligned movement in 1955. He was trying to position India as a leader of a third block of nations that would stay neutral within the Cold War. With this, a domestic arms industry in general and an indigenous jet fighter in particular were the glory to Indian prestige. In fact, the Prime Minister and... The defense minister ordered this fighter more with an eye to self-sufficiency and national pride than meeting military requirements. The prime minister also believed the project could spur growth in other sectors of the economy. Before the project began, the United States sold Pakistan F-86 Sabres and F-104 Starfighters, which set off the balance of power within the region. With this, instead of approaching the UK for more hawkers or going to the east or west for more new jet aircraft, the Indian government settled on the creation of a domestic fighter program. The military set out the requirements to be a max speed of Mach 2, a combat range of 500 miles, and an airframe that could be modified for all weather aircraft, carrier, and advanced trainer missions. For the program history, during the Second World War, India had small aviation infrastructure mostly used for the repairing and overhauling of Allied aircraft. After the Second World War, HAL was made using an old facility near Bangalore. They would move on to producing the de Havilland Chipmunk, the Vampire, and the Fallen Gnat. HAL, though, lacked much to design a new jet fighter, as they didn't have experienced engineers, testing infrastructure, and also lacked designers. Not only was there no hangar space for, to build prototypes, and he also liked tools, test stands, and runways for flight testing. India was facing the same issues as Argentina and Egypt in aircraft design. Due to this, in the Indian government sought German experts to help bridge the gap between ambition and reality. One of the first major aircraft designers they'd approach would be Willy Messerschmitt, though he would deny the offer due to him being content with his work in Spain. In 1956, though, Kurt Tank was approached after the Argentine coup, deciding to visit HAL facilities in 1956. Tank would accept the offer. He hired 18 German engineers and had agreed to a division of labor where only they would do the designing and HAL would create the prototypes along with eventual production. The work would begin in 1957 with the first operational prototype being made four years later. Roadblocks would soon begin, though, with the engine needing to be replaced due to a British firm backing out of the deal. As a consequence, HAL had to switch to the less powerful Orpheus 703, which could not meet the HF-24's performance requirements. First, HAL failed to convince the Orpheus 703 builder to add an afterburner to the design. Then the Soviets were approached with a proposal to modify an existing engine for use on the HF-24 but this was also rejected. Finally, the Indians cooperated with Egypt on the Bradner E-300, an engine whose projected capabilities were adequate for the HF-24. However, trials in Egypt proved that even this engine could not power the plane past Mach 1.1. On the 1st of July, 
1969, the Indian team was recalled from Egypt and cooperation ceased. Failure to obtain a suitable engine meant that the HF-24 was never able to meet its design speed. Still, 145 HF-24s were eventually produced, with 130 entering service. Reasons for Failure Unlike the designs of the Argentine government and the Egyptian government, the HF-24 raises the question of what constitutes as a failure. After all, this aircraft entered production and served in the IAF for more than two decades. Moreover, as one observer put it, the HF-24 could hardly be called a failure when its accident rate was unbelievable. Just one accident and no aircraft lost in combat. Others were less charitable, with one judging the HF-24 to be a long, drawn-out... So how do we explain these discrepancies? If the measuring stick is production for its own sake, then the HF-24 was a success when compared with the Polky 2 and the HA-300. On the other hand, if performance criteria laid down by the Indian Air Staff are selected, such as speed or aircraft carrier operability, then the HF-24 was a failure. Although the original Air Staff specifications were intended to fill a military need, it was equally apparent that political forces were driving a project that exceeded Indian capabilities. One observer later noted, As the project proceeded, it passed from the hands of politicians to the military and finally to industry. Or, to put it another way, the politicians defined the possibilities, the military defined the problem, and the industry was left to define the answer. Poor management also hindered the HF-24. When the aircraft failed to reach its performance objectives, the IAF ordered design changes even as production was underway. This inevitably caused delays and increased costs. The engine fiasco in particular highlighted an ad hoc approach to a problem that was never resolved. From a cost-benefit analysis, the HF-24 was an embarrassment. Not only did the IAF receive an aircraft incapable of performing several intended missions, it did so at a cost greater than superior aircraft offered by the Soviets. Furthermore, excessive production costs, frequent delays, and disappointing performance meant that India could not attract foreign buyers. For an aircraft tutored as Indian-made, the HF-24 was surprisingly cosmopolitan when it came to designers, parts, and tools. One expert put it this way, India remained dependent upon external design sources for all vital systems and materials, lacking a significant commercial industrial base. It also remained dependent on foreign sources for high-grade steel and aluminium for aircraft and production. Still, India had to start somewhere, and the costs and delays plaguing the HF-24, even its relatively poor performance, were not unusual for a first Unfortunately, there are few indicators that India used the lessons learned from the HF-24 to build a better aircraft in the future. Not surprisingly, the IAF had its doubts about the HF-24. The air staff preferred foreign aircraft and, if given the choice, would have selected imports like the MiG-21 or Mirage 3 instead. However, the IAF did not have options in a matter already decided by the politicians and was forced to settle for an aircraft incapable of fulfilling many of its own design requirements. As with any new aircraft, the HF-24 had its own share of design faults, many of which were not adequately addressed as the aircraft was rushed into production. For instance, the HF-24 suffered from excessive aerodynamic tail drag, and it was incapable of firing all four of its cannons at once. Finally, constant redesigned plus an overburdened production shop resulted in chronic part shortages over the HF-24's career. Many became hangar queens, awaiting delivery of parts. Meanwhile, the Soviets were marketing the superior MiG-21 fighter at an attractive price. This was an offer that could not be refused. And in August 1962, only one year after the Maru test flight, India signed a MiG-21 contract with a favorable financing and licensed production of this aircraft at home. The long-term consequences. India never achieved the Prime Minister's dream of self-sufficiency in combat aviation. 
Despite the vast sums poured into the HF-24 during the 1971 war with Pakistan, over 40% of India's air order of battle was of Soviet origin. Twenty years later, the picture has not improved. 75% of India's interceptors and 60% of its strike aircraft were of Soviet origin. Moreover, licensed production of the MiG-21 was not equivalent to designing and producing domestic combat jets. Unlike Argentina and Egypt, however, India never lost the desire to develop her own fighter jets. In the early 1980s, the IAF issued a requirement for a light combat aircraft that would be designed and produced domestically. Nearly three decades later, and after numerous delays and cost overruns, those requirements have crystallized in HAL's Tejas fighter, an aircraft that may be obsolete before it has been built. Others point to the Tejas American engine, question the aircraft's claim to be of indigenous origins. Still, a country embarking on the road to self-sufficiency in combat jets has to start somewhere. While the HF-24 was essentially a stillborn, perhaps the Tejas will be the start of a promising future for India's military and aviation industry. Now for pilot testimonies. In a 2019 interview with an ex-IAF pilot, these following questions were asked. Which three words best describe the HF-24? Pretty, promising, played. What were your first impressions? Having already flown the Hunter, a similar class of aircraft, at Operation Conversion Unit, the move to the HF-24s wasn't daunting. The Hunter had a better thrust-to-weight ratio. However, the HF-24 supersonic design and spacious cockpit and pleasant cockpit interiors looked inviting. There was also the hope that the aircraft would get better engine, gaining speed and punch. What was the best thing about it? Good, low-level handling, fast and responsive. Would clock at around 620 knots at 500 feet in the late production extended core D series, and around 650 knots in the earlier BD series. Twin engines ensured safety from bird hits at low levels, and a spacious cockpit facilitated map storage and reading. What was the best thing about it? The large number of technical issues that plagued the aircraft and the HF-24's pressure hydraulic system was prone to failures. Backup manual controls mitigated the impact of such failures, but there was always fear of leaking hydraulic fluid to catch fire. There were several cases of compressor blades rubbing against the engine, casing leading to catastrophic designers. Poor HAL workmanship caused fatal accidents such as canopy jettisoning failure. In conclusion, overall, while a failure not meeting the design requirements and having plenty of technical issues, the HF-24 seemed to have been well-liked by the pilots who have used it. 